Hello everyone and welcome. I'm Fernando Florido, a GP in the United Kingdom. Today we'll be reviewing the nice clinical knowledge summaries of CKS on osteoporosis, prevention of fragility fractures, looking at two scenarios, assessment and management, both updated in April 2023. I have summarized the guidance from a primary care perspective and have put links in the episode description. Please note that this is my interpretation of the guidelines, not medical advice. Always use your clinical judgment when treating your patients. Remember that you can check the podcast version in the description below. Please stay until the end, as I'll be sharing fictitious clinical cases created by ChatGPT that will illustrate how the guideline is applied in real-life situations. So, with that said, let's dive in. The episode has three parts, assessment, management and prescribing information. Osteoporosis is characterized by low bone mass and increased bone fragility and it is asymptomatic until a fracture occurs. A fragility fracture is a fracture following a fall from standing height or less, typically in the wrist, spine and hip. Vertebral fractures may occur spontaneously. Risk factors for osteoporosis include female sex, increasing age, menopause, oral steroids, smoking and excess alcohol, previous fragility fracture or parental history of hip fractures, inflammatory arthropathies such as rheumatoid arthritis and a bone mass index or BMI of less than 18.5. How should we assess a person for fragility fracture risk? First, we need to exclude other causes like metastatic bone disease, multiple myeloma, osteomalacia and Paget's disease and also exclude secondary causes of osteoporosis, like for example, endocrine conditions such as menopause, hypogonadism, diabetes and hypothyroidism, inflammatory arthropathies such as rheumatoid arthritis, and gastrointestinal malabsorption conditions like in Crohn's disease, ulcerative colitis, celiac disease and chronic pancreatitis. We should also exclude chronic conditions like chronic liver disease and COPD. And we will then assess for vitamin D deficiency and inadequate calcium intake, especially if they are over 65 years of age, not exposed to much sun and with a dietary calcium intake of less than 700 mg per day. There are online calculators to estimate dietary calcium and the link is in the episode description. We will also assess risks of falls and we will offer a DEXA scan without calculating a fragility fracture risk to those over 50 years of age with a history of fragility fracture or younger than 40 years of age who have a major risk factor for fragility fractures. And we will consider starting drug treatment without a DEXA scan in people with vertebral fractures. We will normally assess the fracture risk first Then, depending on the results, we will do a DEXA scan and then, depending on the scores, we will consider treatment. So, for all other people with risk factors, we will calculate the 10-year fragility fracture risk prior to DEXA scan using online assessment calculators such as Q-Fracture, which is the preferred one, or FRAX. If using FRAX, we must know that it underestimates the risk of oral steroids, a history of fragility fractures, and smoking and alcohol excess. Now that we have completed the assessment, how should we interpret the fragility fracture risk score? People at high risk have a Q fracture score of 10% or greater or are in the red zone of FRAX. People at intermediate risk have a Q fracture score close to but below 10% or are in the orange zone of FRAX. People at low risk have a Q fracture score below 10% or are in the green zone of FRAX. And how should we manage fragility fracture risk scores? If at high risk, we will arrange a DEXA scan and offer drug treatment if the T-score is minus 2.5 or lower. If the T-score is greater than minus 2.5, we will modify risk factors, treat any underlying conditions and repeat the DEXA scan usually within two years. If at intermediate risk with risk factors, we will arrange a DEXA scan and offer drug treatment if the T-score is minus 2.5 or lower. If at low risk of fragility fracture, we will not arrange a DEXA scan and we will offer lifestyle advice and follow up within five years. What drug treatments are recommended? 
we will prescribe a bisosphonate first line in primary care RL and tronic acid 10 mg once daily or 70 mg once weekly or resedronate 5 mg daily or 35 mg once weekly. We will consider bisosphonate if taking oral steroids equivalent to prednisolone 7.5 mg daily or more for 3 months or longer. All the bisosphonate are licensed for use in postmenopausal women. However, only daily alendronate and weekly resedronate are licensed for use in men. If an oral bisosphonate is not possible, we will refer to secondary care for consideration of other options such as solindronic acid, strontium granulate, raloxifene, denosumab and teriparatide. If the dietary calcium intake is adequate, that is 700 mg a day, we will prescribe 10 micrograms or 400 international units of vitamin D without calcium for people not exposed to much sunlight. If calcium intake is inadequate, we will prescribe the same dose of vitamin D with at least 1000 mg of calcium daily. Or for elderly people who are housebound or living in a nursing home, we will prescribe 20 micrograms or 800 international units of vitamin D with at least 1000 mg of calcium daily. And we will also consider HRT for younger postmenopausal women. What lifestyle information and advice should we give? We will advise exercise, a balanced diet, stop smoking and drink alcohol within recommended limits. We will also give appropriate patient education. How should we follow up a person at risk of fragility fractures? After bone sparing treatment, we will ask about adverse effects, in particular upper GI, such as dyspepsia or reflux. These are common initially and often improve with time. Symptoms of atypical fractures, including new onset hip, groin or thigh pain. If this occurs, we will stop treatment and arrange an X-ray of the femur. For those taking steroids, we will continue by sosphonate and or calcium and vitamin D. Supplements until corticosteroids have stopped. Then we will reassess the osteoporotic risk. For all other people, we will review the need for bisphosphonate after 3-5 to five years. If they remain at high risk, we will continue alendronic acid for up to 10 years and resedronate for up to 7 years for those over 75 or with a previous hip or vertebral fracture. In other people, we will arrange a DEXA scan and we will consider continuing treatment if the T-score is less than minus 2.5. We will then reassess every 3-5 to five years, stopping treatment if the T-score is greater than minus 2.5 and reassess after 2 years. We are now going to look at the prescribing information on calcium and vitamin D supplements and bisosonates, although for further information we will check the British National Formulary or BNF. Some of the contraindications for calcium and vitamin D preparations are hypercalcemia, hyperparathyroidism, current renal stone disease, CKD stage 4 or 5, an allergy to peanuts or soya, knowing that soya oil-free products are available. Some of the interactions of calcium and vitamin D preparations include digoxin, thiazides and steroids, as well as impaired absorption with a number of drugs, including bisosphonates, so a period of time needs to be left before taking them. Some of the contraindications of bisosphonates include low calcium, low vitamin D or parathyroid dysfunction. This should be treated before starting it. Severe CKD and being unable to be upright for at least 30 minutes or if there is a delay in esophageal emptying such as stricture or achalasia to reduce the risk of esophageal reactions. Adverse effects of bisphosphonates include musculoskeletal pain and gastrointestinal symptoms including esophageal reactions. Also, osteonecrosis of the jaw and the external auditory canal and atypical stress fractures. Interactions with bisphosphonates include an increased risk of gastrointestinal irritation with non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, decreased absorption of the bisphosphonate with calcium supplements and antacids, as well as with food and drinks. A minimum of 30 minutes should be left between them. Routine bisphosphonate advice is as follows. They should be taken on an empty stomach. 
that should be swallowed whole with at least 200 ml of water while in an upright position and must not lie down for at least 30 minutes. If a dose is missed, for daily preparations they should skip that day and continue the next day as usual. They should not take a double dose. For weekly preparations, they should take it on the day that it is remembered and continue on the usual weekly day, but two tablets should not be taken on the same day. We should inform about possible side effects including symptoms of atypical fracture such as hip, groin or thigh pain and of osteonecrosis of the jaw such as jaw pain, swelling and redness. We should advise them to have any necessary dental work done before starting by sulfonates and to have regular dental checkups and good oral hygiene thereafter. Now that we have reviewed the guideline, let's look at three clinical cases that illustrate some of the concepts we have discussed. I have used ChatGPT to generate these random patients. The first patient is John Smith, a 60-year-old man who develops a collis fracture after tripping over and falling while walking his dog. How should he be assessed? Firstly, given that the fracture happened after falling from standing height, we can state that John has sustained a fragility fracture. Considering that he's over 50 with a history of a fragility fracture, we should arrange a DEXA scan without needing to calculate the fragility fracture risk. We should also consider alternative diagnosis and screening. We will arrange general blood tests, which according to our clinical judgment, could include the following. Male hormones for screening of hypogonadism, vitamin D levels to check for osteomalacia, ESR, CRP and rheumatoid factor to check for inflammatory arthropathies, HbA1c to screen for diabetes, TFTs to check for hypothyroidism, PTH levels to check for hyperparathyroidism, and liver function tests to check for chronic liver disease. We will also consider looking for evidence of malignancy, including, for example, immunoglobulin electrophoresis, calcium and urinary bands joint protein to screen for multiple myeloma. We could also look at x-rays and the alkaline phosphatase level to screen for Paget's disease of the bone. Finally, depending on the clinical situation, we could screen for conditions causing malabsorption, such as checking fecal calprotectin for Crohn's disease and anti-gliadin antibodies or tissue transglutaminase antibodies for celiac disease screening. We will also assess risk of falls and calcium intake. We will consider treatment depending on the DEXA scan result. However, if you had had a vertebral fracture instead of a collis fracture, drug treatment should be considered even without a DEXA scan. The second patient is Jane Thompson, who is 62. Her medical history includes hypertension, type 2 diabetes, asthma and a TIA five years ago. Risk factors include a family history of osteoporosis, a sedentary lifestyle and a history of smoking having quit five years ago following her TIA. Routine blood tests are normal, including vitamin D and calcium. Her EGFR is 65 and she's otherwise asymptomatic. She comes to see you because she's concerned because her mother had a hip fracture and was diagnosed as having osteoporosis when she was 60. What further steps should we take? Before considering a DEXA scan, to make a diagnosis, we should calculate Jane's fragility fracture risk and based on her risk factors, the Q fracture score is 11.7%. This puts her in the high risk category. Since Jane is at high risk, we should arrange a DEXA scan to assess the bone mineral density. If the T-score is minus 2.5 or lower, drug treatment should be offered. If the T-score is greater than minus 2.5, risk factors and any underlying conditions should be managed and a repeat DEXA scan should be scheduled within two years. Now Jane's T-score is minus 2.8 and osteoporosis is diagnosed. How should we manage her? Because the T-score is less than minus 2.5, she should have a bisphosphonate, for example, alendronic acid, 70 mg weekly can be prescribed as first-line treatment for osteoporosis. 
we will assess Jane's dietary calcium using, using online calculators and we will conclude that her intake is adequate. Jane is not exposed to much sun and she should be given vitamin D supplementation. So she will be prescribed 10 micrograms or 400 international units of vitamin D without calcium. What other advice should we give her? Jane should be given advice on exercise, that is engaging weight-bearing exercises, ideally for at least 30 minutes per day, having a balanced diet. Jane will be encouraged to follow a well-balanced diet rich in calcium and vitamin D sources, including dairy products, leafy greens and fortified foods. Smoking cessation, as Jane has a history of smoking, she will be advised to continue to refrain from smoking. And Jane will be advised to limit her alcohol consumption within recommended guidelines. Jane will be provided with appropriate patient education to enhance her understanding of osteoporosis. The third and final patient is Sarah Johnson, who is 68. Her medical history includes hypertension, gastroesophageal reflux disease and osteoporosis, diagnosed after a vertebral fracture seen on an x-ray. Her risk factors are a sedentary lifestyle, history of smoking, having quit 10 years ago, and a family history of osteoporosis, as her mother had a hip fracture. Her medication is alindronic acid, 70 mg once weekly, for the past 5 years, as well as calcium and vitamin D supplements, 1000 mg of calcium and 800 international units of vitamin D daily, after having found that her dietary calcium and sun exposure were insufficient. Her EGFR is 60. How should she be followed up? We should review the side effects. Sarah experienced dyspepsia and occasional reflux during the initial months of starting alindronic acid. However, these symptoms improved over time and continued treatment. We should always be aware of atypical fracture symptoms. And we note that after three years of being on alindronic acid, Sarah started experiencing new onset pain in her right thigh and hip. Suspecting an atypical fracture, she was advised to discontinue the medication and we arranged an X-ray of the femur. A diagnosis of hip osteoarthritis was made and bisulfonate treatment was restarted. Because she has had alindronic acid for five years, we should review the need to continue with bisulfonate treatment. She could have a DEXA scan to assess bone density and response to treatment. However, because Sarah had a previous vertebral fracture, she should be advised to continue alindronic acid for up to 10 years regardless. Sarah underwent a DEXA scan at 5 years, which revealed a T-score of minus 2.8, indicating a continued need for treatment. In conclusion, the management of osteoporosis and fragility fractures requires a comprehensive approach that addresses both the underlying causes and the patient's individual risk factors. We have discussed the importance of detection and diagnosis, the assessment of fracture risks, management strategies and regular reviews. Please keep in mind that this is only a summary and my interpretation of the guideline. Please let me know your views in the comment section below. We have come to the end of this video, I hope that you have found it useful and if so, please hit the like and subscribe buttons. Thank you for watching and goodbye.